Thank you, Elder Ring staff, and good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome our viewers who are watching from wherever. We're glad you're here. When he got up and he said, happy, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, happy Sabbath, and he's, it's going to be happy A day, and I thought, what day is it? Is anybody else with me on that? They just start to run together. It's not a bad thing, but, you know, you get to a point where it's like, what day is it? Oh, it is Friday. It's the preparation day. Praise the Lord for that. Um, so glad to be here at camp meeting. I remember my first camp meeting, and uh, I want to tell you, I, I, the first time I ever, the idea of taking a week off of work to go to camp meeting, and I know there are church members today are like, what? And look, I only got so much vacation. Man, I, I, I was hooked. First time I, I took a, a, in fact, my wife was pregnant with our first child, my son Caleb, and uh, we slept in a tent. And, you know, we, I'm not a, a camper. So, I, you know, I went to the store, I think it was a Walmart, and I got a tent. I thought all tents kept water out. I thought that's what they were designed to do. So we woke up wet every morning, you know, $25 Walmart tent doesn't keep the water out. So every day we'd be hauling it. My wife was pregnant. I mean, she, we, we, it was two weeks before she gave birth, if not one. And we're sleeping on the floor of the tent. And, uh, and we loved it. And we've been at camp meeting ever since. Now I have to be at camp meeting. I work at camp meetings and things like that. But I, I'd still be here. And I'm glad you are here. And I think that, well, the Lord has a blessing for us this morning, and I want to ask that he would bless our time. So I'm going to ask if you bow your heads while I do so. Father in heaven, oh, Father, you have been gracious to us this camp meeting. Your spirit has been pronounced on this campus uh, through all the different speakers and seminars, Lord, and, and just on the moving in our own hearts, reminding us of who are. We're children of the Most High God. And Father, this morning, as we come here, not to hear any man, but to hear your voice to us, I pray that you would anoint my lips, Lord, and may I speak that which is pleasing in your sight. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I was thinking, when I was thinking of the title for this, the title that came to my mind for today is The Peril of Prayer, which is kind of an odd title because prayer, when we talk about prayer, it's always positive. Prayer is a great thing, and it is a great thing, and we talked about prayer yesterday. In fact, yesterday, we were talking about our uh, uh, relationship with Christ, and we were looking at in the context of relationships in general, how all relationships have at least three fundamental pieces that determine their success, and those three pieces were time and communication and expression. Time was pretty straightforward. We need to make time with God. Undivided attention time in which we communicate through the process of prayer and Bible study. Some of the ways we talked about expressing in our relationship was how we express our love and feelings to each other. Uh, finding out the things that each other likes so that we can do those things. Telling other people about the relationship. I just barely touched on that, but that last one, that's the one I want to spend some time on today. And so why the title, The Peril of Prayer? Did you know there are times when prayer is not a good thing? There's an interesting story in the book of Joshua after, Je after the Israelites conquered Jericho and they were going to go into Ai. In fact, Ai was such a small little place that they just sent a few people in to take care of it and they were wiped out. The Israelites, they just conquered Jericho. So Joshua gets on his knees and he's praying before the Lord. Anybody remember this story? What did the Lord tell Joshua? Get up off your face. What are you doing praying? You've got work to do. There's sin in the camp and you haven't dealt with it. Wow. Now, Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ shares a powerful statement 
about when prayer may not be as powerful as it needs to be. Notice this. From page 101, it says, God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. Now, I've got to be careful here, but I know certain ministries over the years who have encouraged people to, es- to uh, escape to God. Go off in some remote place and you can raise your kids in some re- remote, isolated, whatever. And I'll be honest with you, those have been some of the hardest church members I've ever had to work with. And here's why. Because they're not involved in anything. Because they think their only mission field is their family. Do yourself a favor and do a search in the writings of Ellen White for this phrase, me and mine. Me and mine. She talks about people who think that's their only service. She says, God has called you to reach others besides just your family. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have a responsibility, and our number one responsibility isn't to our families. I'm not saying that. But notice, and this is where she's going, God does not mean that any of us should become hermits and monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life between the mountain and the what? The multitude. He who does nothing but pray will what? Soon cease to pray. Or... His prayers will become a formal routine. When men take themselves out of social life, interaction with others, out away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, that word duty is not a popular word today, when they cease, cease to work earnestly for the master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer. And have no incentive to devotion. See, we were talking about the relationship and devotion of life yesterday. And I know multitudes of Seventh-day Adventists who struggle with this, unbeknownst to them, because they're missing a key component. Now, you know what a tripod is, don't you? A tripod has how many legs? I mean, you try three, three legs, right? And, the, and, and you try, they make tripods for different purposes. You set things on them, cameras or what have you. And, of course, those three legs are essential. You lose one of those legs, and you don't have a tripod. You have a bipod, and it doesn't work as well. Right? Well, in the Christian life, you've got, you've got a tripod of a foundation. You've got your Bible study, and you've got your prayer, but you also have that expression part of witnessing. And I'm going to tell you that if you don't have that in your, in your active Christian experience, this is what's going to happen. You're going to lose the subject matter for prayer, and you're going to lose the incentive for devotion. See, when you're sharing your faith, I'm just going to be honest with you here. I've been in this for 20 plus years as a Christian, sharing my faith the whole time, and I still, on a regular basis, encounter people asking me things I don't know the answer to. Now, sometimes lay people think, well, you know, if I were a pastor, if I were this or that, then I would witness more because I would know more. (laughs) No. But that's how you learn. In fact, that's how I've learned as much as I have is when people ask me things I don't know and I have to study it out. And it drives you to devotion. See, the incentive to devotion often comes from interacting with others. The subject matter for prayer. Like, what do I pray about? Look, when you're out witnessing with somebody, you know what to pray about. And when they're asking you questions you can't answer, they might even tend to shake your faith. You know what to pray about. But when we pull ourselves out of that part of Christian life, it says we lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, pleading for strength wherewith to work. Wow, indeed. Now, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at a parable today, maybe a little bit different than you have looked at it in the past. Matthew chapter 12 is very short, just two verses we're going to look at here, three verses. Matthew 12, we're going to look at verse 43. Matthew 12 and verse 43. The Bible says in verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a what? Out of a man, 
He goes through dry places seeking rest, desert places, right? There's nothing, he's not finding anything. Seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my what? Okay, what was his house? It was a man, it was a person. So this demon, this evil spirit is dwelling in this person. He kind of likes it there, but then the Bible says he goes out of the person. I want you to track with me here. When, if, a, if an evil spirit needs a place to live, which is the way this is painted up, just in the imagery, so I don't want to take it too literalistically, but you get the idea, that why does he leave the man in the first place? Let's be real clear on this. He gets evicted. When does the evil spirit get evicted from a man? When he accepts Christ. Don't miss it. This man we're reading about, this old house, is somebody who accepted Christ. So the spirit gets evicted and he goes around and he looks for another place. But he doesn't find any. So he says, I'm going to return to my house. Maybe I'll get back in. And when he comes, he finds it, what? Empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Jesus says, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now, when you're going to move into a place... How many of you have ever looked for a place and you, you find a place you like, but it needs cleaned up? You ever had that happen? Nothing better than finding a place, not only that, that is, is a, hey, it's empty, that's key, <laughs> but it's move-in ready. Sometimes people advertise it that way. It's cleaned up. A guy goes back and he finds it cleaned and swept and in order and empty. And, of course, it's describing the old house, which is the man, this person. This person who had at some point given their life to Christ, and that's why the Spirit got evicted, but he comes back looking and he finds it empty. Now, how many of you have read this before? And when we look at the emptiness, what would you say is empty? What's missing? What isn't there? Okay, Holy Spirit, I've heard Christ is, those are the more common answers, and, and that's true, but I, I want to look at something a little different this morning, Okay? So here's the man, and when he comes back, obviously, he came to Christ at some point, but there's, the emptiness allows for that, that spirit to come in. Now, I'm going to come back to that, okay? I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Now, when Jesus called his disciples, we looked at it the other day when Jesus called Peter, right? And he called the others. He had the great miracle of the fish. And then he says, you know, Peter says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And the Lord said, from now on, you're going to catch men. You remember that? And then the Bible says they forsook all and followed. Now, I've asked a question before. I'm going to ask you this morning, a question I've asked other people. Is there a difference between a disciple and a Christian? Okay? Is there, there's a, I hear some yeses out there. Uh, so let me clarify it this way. Should there be? Okay, good. That's a good answer. Because there really, there really shouldn't be, and I want to show you that in Acts chapter 11. We're going to go to Acts chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 19. Not 19, we're going to look at verse 26. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. All right, Acts 11, verse 26 says, speaking of Barnabas, in fact, we'll look at, pick up on verse 25. It says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the who? The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Is there a difference between a disciple and a Christian? It's interesting to me that the early church didn't call themselves Christians. They were called Christians by the people who knew them. Christians, we might say. They were called Christians by others. And I've shared this with our class this week, and some of you may be aware that the Methodist church did not adopt the name Methodist. Methodist was a, bad, it was a, it was a pejorative name they were called. Because, you see, John Wesley had been convicted that 
that holiness was important in the life of a Christian. And so he would be particular in how he obeyed the Lord. He thought that was important. You think that's important? Read the book of Deuteronomy over and over. It says, be careful in how we observe uh, the Lord. Anyway, the statutes of the Lord, what have you. So they, they called Wesley and said, you, you got a method for everything. You're, you're Methodist. And the name stuck. That's where they got it from. They got it from somewhere else. Well, same with the name Christian. You, you, you guys are a bunch of Christians. Now, why would you call somebody a Christian? All they were about. They lived like Christ. They talked about Christ. They ate and breathed and slept Christ. And you're just a bunch of Christians. And the name stuck. But make no mistake that there was no difference between the disciple and the Christian. Now, some of you said, yeah, there, there, you know, there is a difference. And I know what you meant by it. If there was a difference, if we were to say there was a difference between a disciple and a Christian, what would we just say? What is the difference? A disciple is different from a Christian how? They're an active Christian, right? It's kind of sad that we would have to make that distinction now, isn't it? They're an active Christian. Should there be such thing as an inactive Christian? Well, let's look at it a little bit. I want to, I, I want to explain, you know, the Great Commission is that we go and make what? Disciples. Well, we better be clear on what we're supposed to be making, shouldn't we? What is a disciple? Before I go anywhere, I don't, and I don't, hold on a minute. We're going to back out of Christianity altogether, okay? That, we're not going to go, we're not becoming heathen, that's not what I'm saying. But I don't want Christian terms. Because disciple is a term that goes beyond Christianity, okay? You don't have to be in Christianity to say disciple. There are, other, there are other faiths, and even outside of the whole faith community, there are people who use the word disciple. What is, in that broad sense, what is a disciple? Okay, I hear follower, student, both good answers. A follower for what reason? How many would agree that a disciple is a follower? Okay, or a student. A student is good too. Why are they following? Because they want to be like the person they're following. I mean, that's a distinctive about a disciple, right? Would you agree with that? A disciple follows somebody, not just to follow, but for the purpose of becoming like the one they're following. Okay? Now, we see that in Luke chapter 6, if you go to Luke 6 with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 6. And uh, we're going to look at verse 40. <laughs> I was in Matthew 6. See, I do that sometimes. And I thought... There is no verse 40 here. Do I have the verse right? Luke 6 and verse 40. You know why I tell you things like that, incidentally? Because sometimes it's easy for you sitting and listening to think that the guys up front got it all worked out. We talk about devotional life, and you're like, I sure wish I could get mine down. And you imagine, I've had, I've had people, it's not always just the person up front. I can't tell you how many members have struggled and I visit with them and they say pastor why is it easy for everybody but me it's not we're all in the same boat together we all have the same savior Jesus and we all need him uh, Luke 6 verse 40 says a disciple is not above his teacher but everyone who is perfectly what trained will be like his teacher. Now, the idea here is just what we said about discipleship, and that's what Jesus is saying. This is discipleship. A discipleship, the goal of the disciple is to become like the teacher. Well, that follows with what we were just saying, so that's not, shouldn't be a great, great revelation. Now, I want to go somewhere else here to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 23. This is a very common verse You've probably heard it before. Again, I may want to look at it a little differently than you have been accustomed to. Jesus is giving the qualification for a disciple. If you want to be a disciple, you, this is how it is. So he says in Luke 9, 23, the Bible says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, we could say follow me. Let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross 
daily and follow me. For whoso, or whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this is a really great verse for lots of reasons. First thing he says, first qualification of disciple is the disciple's got to be willing to deny himself. What does that mean? That means to say what to yourself? No. That's part of Christianity. And how often in the context of this verse? Because the, 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 the denying yourself and taking up the cross is together and it's on a daily basis. Now, I'm going to tell you, saints, and this is, uh, I know people are well-meaning when they do it, but I've had Christians say, there's some things that go around today, like people will say, oh, it's easy to be saved and hard to be lost. Okay, I guess I could make a case for that. Um, you know, when you, you just, you just need to, you can't do it yourself, so you just need to ask God and have him take it away. Well, there are some instances I could flesh that out, but here's why I have a problem with that. If, for one, it contradicts what Jesus says here. Now, if if, if, let me put it this way. When I first became a Christian, I had, and this is back in the day, and some of you remember this, some of you won't, it doesn't matter. Uh, but there was a, there was a, I was into these action movies, and there was this movie called Die Hard. It was one of my favorite movies. In fact, it's, it's on the top 100 list, top 10, I think, of all time, even today. A lot of people just love this movie. Well, you know, anytime a movie hits big, then it becomes number one, number two, number three, number four, because Hollywood knows it's a moneymaker, Right? So I saw Die Hard, and I saw Die Hard 2, and I became converted right before Die Hard 3 came out. And you know, I am just like, I, and I'm convicted, I shouldn't be going to these, but I'm like, I really want to go see 3. And I remember talking to a young man in my, in my church who said, hey, you know what? If you feel like going, go ahead and go, because if God didn't want you to go, he's just going to take away that desire. And even in my, and I want to tell you, I did not know a lot at that time at all. I was fairly new, but something told me that would not be a good idea. <laughs> okay, but I, there's this mentality today that God's going to take everything away. And I can tell you stories about things God's taken away in my life. I worked construction, and I swore I'd embarrass a sailor the way I swore. Every other word I swore, and all of a sudden, I mean, it was within like a week of time, boom, it was gone. But, but that isn't the way it works with everything. And I don't know why. Sometimes I think the Lord just wants you to see his power. And then he says, now you know I have the power. Now I want you to put forth some effort and show me that you believe me. I don't know for sure. But I'm just telling you, it just doesn't always work automatically. Now Jesus is saying that here. There's going to be this denial. There are times you've got to say no to yourself. There are times... On a regular basis. That's the Christian, it's part of the Christian life. And I'm sharing that with you so you don't, because it can get discouraging. I thought to myself at one point, well, maybe I'm not cut out to be a Christian because it's not just all taken away. Well, the Lord will take it away as you choose the path, He'll give the power. But Jesus says, anyone, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. And I kind of went, I even start, have started venturing down that road now. Because when we read this, what do we usually think of? What does this mean? Jesus said, you want to come after me? You need to do what? Give me some practical things. Don't go see Die Hard 3. Right? What else? Okay, I love your enemy. I hear somebody say, don't watch things you, you shouldn't watch. What are you saying no to yourself about? Food, right? Bad habits and things like that. And that's true. I mean, that's absolutely true. And, I, and, and for so long, that was where my focus was, that you deny yourself of your bad habits so that you can prepare for heaven. However, it was Mark Finley that asked this question once, and it prompted a whole different thought process. He said, because you see, this is discipleship. Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, right? And so the whole idea is we're, we're following him. He already did it, and we're going behind him. That's what it means, because that's discipleship. Whatever he's asking us to do is what he did. And so Finley asked this question. What bad habits did Jesus deny so he could have if we're be on the right path? Or, well... <laughs> That's ridiculous. I thought, well, obviously it is. He didn't, he didn't give up anything bad. 
so that he could be saved. He gave up something good so we could be saved. Isn't that right? Let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now listen, where did you take up a cross in Jesus' day? You don't see a guy carrying a cross in the marketplace. Are those kumquats there? I'll take some of those. Oh, this thing's getting heavy. You're not going to have that. You, you, you take a cross to one place, your crucifixion. Right? That's, you're carrying it, and that's where you're going in most cases. Where did Jesus take his cross? To his crucifixion, for what purpose? For us to be saved. So follow along here. Jesus didn't give up bad things so he could be saved. He gave up good things so we could be saved. He was even willing to lay down his life so others could be saved. And he says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to do what I did. You've got to be willing to say no to yourself, even to good things if that's what it takes so others can be saved. You've got to be willing to deny, lay down your life, and let's just be real clear here, lay down your life doesn't mean you ain't going to be a martyr. Maybe it means instead of going and finishing up that medical degree so I can make lots of money, like I want to do and have that big house and the boat and everything else, the Lord's called me to be a missionary in China, and nobody's even going to know my name, and I'm going to live a hard life, but I'm willing to do it because my master laid down his life so I could be saved. And let me just give you a little hint here this morning. You don't have to, be, you don't have to go to China to do that. Because there's a lot of missionary work to do right where you live. That was what Jesus called his disciples to. That's what it meant when they forsook all. They, they put all behind him and put Christ first. And they laid everything down to be a part of that ministry to others. Are you following that? Again, if we're going to follow, if discipleship is following Jesus as the master because we want to emulate him, let's just ask this question. What was Jesus' life about? If you were to sum up the life of Jesus in a sentence, now I hear some people say, but what to, one of my best favorite summaries is Luke 19.10 where Jesus, it's not my summary, it's, the words of Christ, the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Let me ask you a question. Is there any part of Christ's life, his ministry on earth, that that doesn't fit? Can you say, well, there was that one time he really wasn't thinking about seeking and saving the lost. And there was that time over there. You can't do it, can you? There's not a time and moment in Christ's earthly existence where he wasn't thinking about seeking and saving the lost. What about now? What about his heavenly existence? Do you think there's a time where the Lord says, you know what, I'm going to sit down and go watch Netflix for a while. I'm kind of burned out on, on saving people. I'll start again in the morning. It's, kind of, it's ridiculous, isn't it? There's not a moment, there's not a moment that passes that Jesus isn't thinking about seeking and saving the lost. That's why his parting words to his disciples was the Great Commission. Every gospel shares it a little differently, but those are his parting words in every case. It's the heaviest thing on his heart. So how can it be that a person would call themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ and have no desire to seek and save the lost? I mean, if discipleship is following the master in order to be like him, and that is the sum and substance of his life, let me illustrate it this way. How many of you know who Michael Jordan is? Michael Jordan is a basketball player, former, but he's retired now, but he's um, arguably one of the best players, if not the best player that was. And in the day, in my day, there was, in, there was even a song, Gatorade had a commercial, and they made a song called Be Like Mike. Anybody remember the song about Be Like Mike? I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that to you, because when I do that, then you're going to sing it all day. I didn't intend that. But, you know, th there were a lot of young men who wanted to be like Mike. They wanted to be like Michael Jordan, this great basketball player. Now, Michael Jordan, one of the things Michael Jordan pioneered was the Air Jordan. Had his own shoe. That's the, uh, the, uh, the first edition Air Jordan there. And all, oh, they bought them up. People bought them up. And they weren't cheap shoes. Why did people buy them up? Because they wanted to be like Mike, right? 
That was, they were emulating. They, were, they wanted to be his disciples, in essence. And you can, you, can, you can buy the Air Jordans. You can buy the 23 jersey. Right? You, you can, there's all, you, and, and people did. Young, young guys did this because they wanted to be like Mike. Now, I want you to just put yourself in the mindset. You grew up, and maybe it wasn't Mike, but you grew up with a hero, and at some point you were emulating, you wanted to be like whoever. So let's just say it was Mike. I'm going to be like Mike, and I'm going to get the Air Jordans, and, I, and I'm going to get the, the jersey, and I might even shave my head bald. I mean, I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to be like Mike, except for one thing. You really hate basketball. You just can't stand it. Basketball does not interest you in, it, in the least. Does it make any sense that you would choose a hero to emulate who the substance of their life is something you're not interested in? Like the one thing they're known for, it's like, well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not into that. Does that make any sense at all? Brothers and sisters, why would we dare call ourselves Christians if we have no interest in the lost? This is what discipleship means. And Jesus said we're to be making disciples. And I want to ask you a question. Is that what's happening today? Or are we just making church members? Are we ourselves disciples? I want you to notice a statement. You maybe have heard this before from the book Christian Service, page 58. Ellen White says here, It is evident that all the sermons that have been preached have not developed a large class of what she calls self-denying workers. It's just another word for what? A disciple, right? Because a disciple denies himself and follows the master in his, in his cause. All the sermons that have been preached have not developed a large class. That means all the conservative sermons and all the liberal sermons. That means all the law sermons and all the grace sermons. That means all the convicting sermons and all the encouraging sermons and all the fire and brimstone and the Mormon fuzzy and you name it. And we can sit around and debate theology all day long. And I'm on this side and you're on that side and, and yet statistically in North America only 2% of Christians, that's not just Seventh-day Adventists, share their faith on a regular basis. We dare to call ourselves disciples of the Master because we can debate theology. I should have heard an amen or a have mercy to that one. This is what Ellen White continues to say. This subject is to be considered as involving what kind of results? The most serious results. Our future for eternity is at stake. The churches are withering up. Because they don't have a good preacher. Because they don't have enough money. Because they don't have this, that, or the other. No, because they have failed to use their talents in diffusing light. It's not the way it was in the early church. Take your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 Oh, I mean, the, some, there, there are some temptations that are good temptations. Well, maybe, maybe good-ish. And that is, I'd just love to start in Acts chapter 1 and plow through. There's just so much powerful stuff in the book of Acts. So as we're going to chapter 8, I'm thinking, man, I'm just missing all this good stuff. But we're going to go to 8. Chapter 8 and verse 1. Follow along here. It says in chapter 8 and verse 1 of the book of Acts. Now Saul, speaking of Saul the persecutor... Incidentally, just so you know, Saul was the Hebrew name, Paul was the Greek name. Because the people will say, well, one's pre-conversion, one's post. That's not true, because sometimes they called him Saul even afterwards. Saul, Paul, was consented to Stephen's death, the first martyr of the Christian church. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except who? 
except the apostles. It says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, what? Now, preaching the word. You need to understand something in the New Testament. The word that's translated preaching, when we think preaching, we think what I'm doing. This is preaching. But in the Greek language, preaching is just verbally communicating. I mean, it could be like this. Or it could be down there, me just talking one-on-one -on -one to one of you, sitting beside you. Have, you sit on a park bench, and that's preaching in this sense. Uh, the reason I'm telling you that is I don't want you to get the idea that everybody, everybody went everywhere and they hired out some hall and they did some big meeting. That's not what it's talking about here. It means the ones who were scattered went about everywhere verbally communicating what they knew about Christ. Okay? Now, here's what, I, I, the first time this hit me, I could, see, I, when I came into the church, my mindset was that the church was built up by the apostles. They did all the preaching, they did all the converting and baptizing, and the lay people just cheered them on. And so when I read this, and it said that, that the whole church was scattered except the apostles, and I so appreciate that Luke records it that way, then when we come to verse 4 and it says, oh, by the way, it was those who were scattered that went and did the preaching of the word. Wait a minute, it just, didn't it just say the apostles were, everybody, the, the scattered ones did not include the apostles, right? It was everybody except the apostles, which meant all the rest of the church members, which meant you, right? Went everywhere preaching the word. Powerful. Now that doesn't mean the apostles didn't preach, it just meant everybody had a part in it. This is why the church grew the way it did. You don't, you know, we just read and say, yeah, 3,000 in a day, that's awesome. And I have to say, now somebody may ups be upset with this, but, you know, we've talked about, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not glad about it, but, you know, you've heard that we're baptizing as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we're baptizing 3,000 a day today. You know that, right? Statistically, the Worldwide Adventist Church. And, and, and you know, it's give or take. But why would you even choose the name three? Because I've read it and I've heard it in public, uh, in, in, you know, programs and things. Why would we even choose the, the, the language of 3,000 a day? Because it makes us feel like the early church, right? I mean, when we hear 3,000 a day, we're like, hey, just like Acts. But here's the problem. In the book of Acts, 120 were baptizing 3,000 a day. Today, 20 million are baptizing 3,000 a day. It's a little bit different. And so I'm glad for the 3,000, but saints, it ought to be a lot more. But it can't be until the church goes everywhere preaching the word. Now I want you to follow along here to something really fascinating, because this group went out and they're scattered and they're preaching everywhere, and we don't find them again until Acts 11. We come to Acts 11 and we discover this little group. Go with me to Acts chapter 11 and verse 19. Acts 11 and verse 19, this is what the Bible says. It says, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. So like there's no question here, right? We just read that Saul was holding Stephen's garments. He'd just been stoned. To we know who that is. And then afterwards the persecution, they were all scattered. It's the same people, the same group. Now, after, uh, now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch preaching the word to no one but the Jews only at that point in time. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, those are just the Greek-speaking Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was what? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. There are those of you listening right now and I will guarantee with what we've already looked at in Scripture that the conviction of the Spirit has come upon you and you're thinking I should be doing more for the cause of Christ. But then you're saying the reason I'm not, I know I am not, because I'm not that good at it. And you know what that means? Your focus is in the wrong place. You're thinking about you. 
The hand of the Lord was upon them. The hand of the Lord was with them. That's the key, and it's going to be with you and me. The Lord didn't call us to share the gospel because he thought we were good at it. It's because he knew what he could do through us. So it says that the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Where's that? Where the apostles, that's GC headquarters. Okay? The word gets back to GC headquarters. What the church members are doing is so powerful, word gets back to GC headquarters, and they're like, maybe we ought to send a representative out there. And just to be clear this morning, your pastor in your church is the representative from Michigan headquarters to help you in your work. That's the idea. And when that idea goes forward, we'll see the growth that we see here. Now they go back, word gets back to the GC headquarters, so they send out Barnabas. The Bible says they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Verse 23, and when he, had, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And encouraged them that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Now, now you've got the GC representative and the church members working together. Now when Barnabas didn't show up, they didn't all say, Oh, whew, boy, that was hard, Barnabas, you go. They kept working, he kept working. Amen. Now, in verse 25, we're kind of coming full circle here. It says, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Now, we read that earlier, but now you know the context. He's like, Saul, you got to come see this. This is great. You ought to see the growth and what's happening in Antioch. He comes to get Tarsus, and it says, come to get Saul at Tarsus, and he says, um, verse 26, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now you know why they were called Christians, because they were acting like Christ, seeking and saving the law. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need this today, don't we? We need a revival among us today of that missionary spirit. Steps to Christ, page 78, says, No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others, sorry, shouldn't be a period there, what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. And I'm going to comment on this in a minute. You remember this. It's impossible for a person to come to Christ and not have that desire. I'm going to, I would imagine that with many of you today who maybe are not as active as you would want to be, you remember having that desire and you remember going out and sharing your faith and you messed up and learned you shouldn't be doing it. Because I run into that all the time. I, this is what I do. I'm a trainer. And I go and I train. And this is the story I get. No, I know. Oh, I remember, man, when I first came in the church. But then I went and I told my whole Catholic family who the Antichrist was. And then the, and the Mark of the Beast was. And I shouldn't have done that. And, yeah, I realized I just better leave it to others. Saints, let me tell you something this morning. That's the way you learn. Nobody starts witnessing perfectly. It's just not going to happen. I mean, do you think you're surprising the Lord? Do you think the Lord asks you to go witness? Like he does in Scripture, the commission is clear, and then you went out and talked to your family like, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean you. I, I didn't realize you would do that. No, don't. I'll get, I'll get somebody else. I mean, he could have used the angels. He's not doing that. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what you were going to say. And the reality is, even that wrong thing you said might be the first step in that person you said it to, getting their selves awakened to spiritual things and turning back to Christ. The Lord's in charge of it. We're too hard on ourselves sometimes. You know who put that in your mind? That you got it all messed up and you should stop? 
It wasn't the Lord Jesus. I'm going to get to that a little bit more in a minute. Notice this statement. Steps to Christ, page 81. The love of Christ revealed to us makes us what? Debtors to all who know Him not. God has given us light not for ourselves alone, but to shed upon them. I mean, what was the problem with the Jewish nation? Why were they in the condition they were in and the mindset they were in when Christ came to reject Him? It's because they had so long hoarded the light to themselves that they forgot their mission and their purpose. You know, when I talk about witnessing, and this is <laughs> one, of the, one of the ways that we fight conviction, and this is one of the most common ways, I hear this on, too often, I hear this, is it's not my gift. You ever, I don't want to ask if you've ever, you could have heard it, you may have said it even. It's just a common thing. It's just like, oh, and I mean, I know members that are kind of educated. I could go and pick shelves, books off the shelf in the ABC that are like, don't let anybody guilt you into witnessing. We're like, yeah, right. I like that. Well, it may make you feel good until that day when you realize that you could have been a means of somebody being in the kingdom and you wouldn't let yourself get guilted into witnessing because it wasn't your gift, see? We say it's not my gift, and why do we do that? I'm going to tell you why we do it, at least in part. That one of the worst, one of the biggest challenges that, that I think that we have, and we didn't, we didn't come up with it in the Adventist church, we borrowed it from other churches, is the spiritual gifts inventory or the spiritual gifts test. You ever take one of these? Don't be ashamed if you've taken one of them. I mean, it's not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not criticizing you for taking it. I just want you to understand it. I mean, it's kind of a fun little exercise, but honestly, you're answering a bunch of questions according to what? What you like, how you feel. And the presupposition is this. The presupposition is that God would never ask you to do anything you don't feel comfortable with. Now, really, are you, are you living the same Christian life I am? Honestly, yeah, God's not going to ask you to do anything if it makes you feel uncomfortable. Let's just have a news flash here. The disciples of Christ... I'm not going to look the text up, I'm going to quote it for you, but Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear him who can kill the body, fear him who destroys both soul and body, who can destroy both soul and body in hellfire. You remember that text? Matthew 10. The context of Matthew 10 is Jesus has just sent the disciples out to witness. And by the way, I've sent people out to witness a long time, and I never had to tell them, don't worry, hey, some of you aren't going to come back alive. That's what he told them. Hey, don't worry if they kill the body. But he tells them in that context, don't be afraid. Now, what kind of people do you say don't be afraid to? You don't say it to bold people. You don't say it to brazen people. You say it to afraid people. What does that tell us about the disciples of Christ? Oh, they were afraid too. I'll let you know this morning that witnessing is not... There are only four spiritual gifts listed in the Bible. Witnessing is not on any one of them. I always tell people it's like standard equipment. When you buy a car, there are options you can get, but there's an engine. There should be an engine in it. Unless you're buying a body for something or the other. But when you get a car, they just they come with engines. You and me have optional engines, but they, they come with that. They come with tires. They come with steering wheels, right? And a Christian, Christianity comes with witnessing. We see it in the early church. Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, the opinion has prevailed that only those who are especially talented are required to consecrate their abilities to the service of God. Those special few that have that ability. It has come to be understood by many that talents are given to only a certain favored class to the exclusion of others who of course are not called upon to share in the toils or the rewards. But it is not so represented in the parable, she's speaking of the parable of the talents, when the master of the house called his servants, he gave to every man his work. Isn't that true? I love this statement here. You are not to wait for great occasions or to expect what? Extraordinary abilities before you go to work for God. God will use what you have. We see this again and again. I mean, what's the loaves and the fishes? What is that? What's that illustrating? I'm not, and it's not allegorical. It's a real story. It's really happened. But here's a boy who brings all he's got to Jesus. Look, I got five loaves and two fish. Okay, we're going to feed a multitude of people and there's still going to be leftovers. How did that happen? 
Let me ask you, honestly, can you explain how it happened? Doesn't matter if you can explain it. It happened because Jesus was there. And when you go to share your faith, Jesus is there. And in the same way that he multiplied the physical bread, he'll multiply the spiritual bread. You give him what you have. You say, all I've got is this. That's okay. All you've got is enough for Jesus. He can use it. People say, I'm not qualified. I don't know enough. I mean, the, incidentally, all of these excuses we give are self-focused. You, know, you hear what I'm saying? I mean, you know, think about it. I, I don't know. I can't do. I'm not. What's, who's that all about? Me. Let's see, does Jesus know enough? Can he, does he qualify? Okay, are they having the angels able to help us? Then what's the problem? Well, but I, I'm the problem. Well, quit thinking about you. Amen? Start thinking about him. He's, look, Jesus called. He's not going to call us to do this. And then just send us on out there and say, yeah, I'll come back and check on you guys later. I'm not qualified. I don't know enough. How much is enough? What's the text you've got to get to? Where's the point in your spiritual experience where you're going to hear one day in Sabbath school or some sermon or you're in your personal study and you're like, that's it, there's the text, now I'm ready. Has anybody here ever had that where you had that moment, it's like, now I know enough because of this. I just learned this thing. It's not going to happen. It's not, I'm telling you it's not going to happen because if that were the case, I wouldn't be witnessing, I wouldn't be preaching. I'd be living for myself and I'd be lost. It's, I'm not qualified. You ever look at the disciples of Christ? I praise God for choosing the disciples. I praise God that Jesus chose the disciples he did. I mean, he could have chosen guys who didn't ever mess up, but that's not the case. And I've told, I've told the students this week, Peter, I, I mean, one of my favorite stories is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and the way Mark records it, I just love it, because, you know, Moses is there, Elijah's there, Peter goes up to Jesus and he says, hey, this is great. Moses, Elijah, it's good for us to be here. Should we make three tents and set up three tents? Lord, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Is this? And the Bible goes, Mark goes on to say this in his gospel, that the reason Peter said that is because he didn't know what to say. Now, here's a good rule of thumb. If you don't know what to say, just don't say anything. But you know what? I don't follow that rule. I say things all the time I shouldn't say. And if I didn't have a Peter there and see what the Lord was able to do, I could get discouraged by saying, praise God for Peter. Because I make those kind of mistakes. You know, Peter, he's going to be daring and bold and cut. I don't know. He's probably trying to cut the guy's head off, but he cut the ear off, right? Peter gets out on the water to walk on the water. But he gets all proud of himself and looks at the guys. Look at me, right? And then he falls in the water. And I say Peter gets a bad rap because he was the only guy who had enough faith to get out on the water. I mean, at least he had that. So I, I mean, you look at the disciples of Christ. You know who the most qualified one was? A guy named Judas. From earthly standpoint. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to the most noble and amazing work that we could ever do. And he has promised to qualify us for that work. And I want to tell you, we have too often been kidding ourselves about our, uh, I mean, there's so much talk today about Christ-centeredness and lifting up Jesus. I agree with it if we're, if we're talking about the real deal. But I want you to consider this statement as we close. Have you so deep an appreciation of the sacrifice made on Calvary that you are willing to make every other interest subordinate to the work of saving souls? That's what that sacrifice meant for Christ. He put... He laid down his life for others. If, if you, do you appreciate it so much? You want to talk about the cross? Let's talk about the cross. The cross means I'm going to do like my master did. Because of what he did for me, I'm laying down my life for others. Have you that kind of appreciation? The same intensity of desire to save sinners that marked the life of the Savior marks the life of his true follower. The Christian has no desire to live for self. He delights to consecrate all that he has and is to the master's service. He is moved by an inexpressible desire to win souls to Christ. Those who have nothing of this desire might be better be concerned for their own salvation. 
Let them pray for the spirit of service. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, brothers and sisters. I've had to pray for the spirit of service. It's not in us to love others like Christ did. But it's what we're called to. And we need to pray that the Lord would continue to put that in our hearts. And then when we take even the littlest bit that we have and we put it into his service, he's going to magnify it for good. Now I'm going to share a story that maybe you've heard me share before. I hear, share it a lot because it's one of my favorites. It's a story of a man who was out on, a, on a, a, a cruise ship. And this was back in the day before they were all lit up as well as they are today. You'll see why that's significant in a minute. And while he was on that boat, he got seasick and he went down into his room feeling sick. Had to lay down on his bed. Had a little porthole window in his room. And he, he, as he's laying there, he hears a, a yell and then a splash. And then somebody says, man overboard. And immediately, he wants to help. And so he jumps out of his bed and remembers real quick why he's laying there. As he starts to feel sick and he's doubled over. And he goes over to the window and he's just torn because he wants to be able to do something to help. And he feels so helpless. And he takes his light and he looks out the window and he tries to see. It's dark out. He tries to see and he can't see anything. And after what seems like an eternity, goes back and he lays down on his bed. And he's just, now he's feeling sicker than ever and he's tossing and turning. Wondering about what happened to the man. In the morning he's feeling better and so very early he's up on the deck. And he sees the captain and he runs up and he says, Captain, I have to know. What happened to the man who fell overboard? Did you get him? And the captain says, listen, I thought it was a lost cause. We couldn't see anything in those dark waters. And just when we were about to give up, somebody shined a light out of a porthole. And we saw him and we pulled him in. Brothers and sisters, maybe all you have is a little light you shine out of a porthole, but God will use it. Christ will use it to win souls if you're just willing to use it. How many of you today will say, Lord, I don't have much, but I'll use it for your cause. Here I am. Send me. How many of you want to commit to that this morning? Jesus will take that commitment and he'll turn it into souls in the kingdom. Father in heaven, oh, Father, we, we so praise your name for giving us the privilege of fellowshipping with you in service. Lord, there's nothing that we have that would deserve having a part in people being saved. Oh, Lord, and that your spirit would only impress our hearts and minds now with the, the, the level of joy we'll have to know in your kingdom, not just that we are there, but others are there because we shined our little light. Father, thank you. We love you. I pray, Lord, renew in us the spirit of service. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.